Thank you, uh, thank you, David. Um, this is a great opportunity for me to speak about uh, the exciting frontiers of looking at the environment and that uh, the unified structure is the exposome, um, and with tools like uh, computational tools like uh, environment-wide association studies. So while this webinar is great and makes accessible of all this knowledge to all, or, or all my opinions to everyone, um, I, the one drawback is that I won't be able to, uh, to see you and interact with you directly face-to-face, -face, but I do emphasize that if you'd like to get in touch with me, to please uh, tweet at me if that's your thing, at ChiragJP, or uh, simply email me at chirag at hms.harvard.edu, or uh, simply check out my website at uh, chiragjpgroup.org. Um, well, you'll find all the news and happenings uh, around our, our group that we're starting in environmental exposure bioinformatics. Let's get started here. So as you know, uh, very simply, phenotypes, clinical, such as clinical traits, uh, uh, things that do, uh, make up who we are, are, can be summarized as a combination of, uh, of genes, uh, summarized here as G and environment. But this sim simple conceptualization is, is, is not so simple under the hood. So uh, we have, there are many phenotypes that, that actually make up who we are, and phenotypes include things like height, eye color, um, gene expression of uh, 30,000 or so genes that we have, and diseases such as type 2 diabetes and cancer, of course, are, are phenotypes. And the genome, uh, the inherited factors that we may be concerned with, it, um, for example, also consists of many different uh, uh, or a multitude of factors, including genes uh, on the order of 30,000, of course, and a million SNPs, so over a million SNPs in each of us. So we all harbor um, actually on the order of 10 million SNPs uh, uh, in between all of us. And of course, the exposome is this idea of co or concept of the, of the comprehensive environmental factors that we encounter from birth to death. So things such as infectious agents, nutrients that we um, are exposed to through our diets, pollutants, and even pharmaceutical drugs are so these non-genetic factors that also influence uh, phenotype. So at the end of the day, phenotypes arise due to genes and environments and combination thereof, and we're exposed to many different ex environmental factors and exposures, but we lack methods to discover the role of these individual ex uh, environmental factors and as a system uh, in phenotypes and multiple phenotypes in disease. So the case is very different with the G, with the genetics uh, today, and so there's this new, uh, uh, an emerging or now emergent paradigm known as the genome-wide association studies, of which we've already co conducted over 1,400 of these, to uh, to assess the uh, the uh, the genome as a whole in terms of of disease risk. So we could ha now have these case control studies in which we look for differences in between genomes to search these 10 million or so factors for. Uh, for, uh, for genetic risk for disease. And it took a new paradigm of GWAS to launch this discovery for, uh, of individual genetic factors in disease. And how we got there was through the Heno Human Genome Project. So as you know, in uh, 2001, we had this joint effort between academia and industry for, for human genome sequencing. Then we were able to characterize common vari variation around, uh, on uh, peoples around the world to understand those 10 million or so variants that differ between humans. And then we had these very accessible measurement tools that unify the assessment of these differences between people. For less than $300, you could get this uh, SNP chip in, in the, uh, in the uh, later 2000. Now you could get this for under $100. Um, and these, these, uh, and these, tech, these technologies get better and better um, with high throughput sequencing, that is full genome sequencing uh, around the bend here. And so what that enable us to do are co these comprehensive high-throughput analyses known as the genome-wide association study, where we took all of these millions or so variants and assessed them in, in disease versus control. So you could think of this as a large, large uh, scale of s uh, search for genetic factors in disease. So, for example, here in this, in this Nature paper in which they looked at uh, over 100,000 genetic variants in disease, uh, seven diseases, uh, uh, some of them include the type 2 diabetes, type 1 diabetes, and so forth, they are able to conduct this uh, very data-driven search for genetic variants in disease, and this has um, uh, supplanted the old way of looking at genetics through candidate gene studies, 
um, and, it, it's e and it has provided robust hypotheses uh, of genetic uh, factors in, in disease outcome. So what I'll, I'll hypothesize to you today is that a new paradigm such as EWAS will allow us uh, for discovery of, of E. So a uh, data-driven and comprehensive view of the environment is required to discover the causes of burdensome diseases today, and, and, these, and this data-driven and comprehensive view is brought to you by, or one of the ways it can be brought to us is through the exposome and, and computational tools like, like EWAS. So why would we need a new paradigm? So this is a, something that uh, I've been challenged with um, continuously on, so on, the, uh, on, on EWAS and the exposome. So if we go back for a second, uh, we could t think of uh, the variability of a phenotype or clinical traits, such as height or body mass index uh, um, and so forth, as uh, the additive or uh, as a combination of the variants due to genetics and environment. So simply extending that uh, first equation that I showed you earlier. Of course, I omit here, uh, for simplicity's sake, the uh, correlation uh, of, of G and E and also the... Um, and also the interaction to the G and E. But just for simplicity and argument's sake, let's uh, suppose that variation or the range of phenotypes that we see can be written down as the range of genetic factors, uh, the contribution of range of genetic factors and the range of environmental exposures. And so this idea of heritability is actually the range of phenotypic vari variability that could be attributed to genetic variability in a population. So. We denote this genomicist, or geneticists denote this as H squared, known as broad sense heritability, and it's the, basically the ratio of the variability due to genes over divided by the variability due, due to phenotypes. So it's an indicator of the proportion of phenotypic differences that can be attributed to differences in, in the genome. And so this is kind of like the basis of how uh, biostatistics started through uh, with Francis Galton in 1885. So I'll give you an example here of height, and it's a, an example of a, a very heritable trait. And so what Francis Galton did is uh, took a whole bunch of families, like you see there on the left there, uh, of parents, and, uh, and ascertained their height, and also ascertained the height of their offspring. And you see simply plotting the height of the offspring uh, versus the height of parents, you see that there's a strong correlation between, between the two. So right away you get a sense that of, of this idea of passing on this phenotype from, from parents to offspring or this notion of heritability. And he concluded that the mid-height, or basically the average of these 205 parents that he was looking at, described 60% of the variability of 928 offspring that he was looking at. So here summarized in, in this, this coefficient here for X, or the average height of, of, of parents. But the case isn't, this, uh, is, isn't that uh, uh, so straightforward for the things that we're really interested in today in, in, in human disease and in genetics and exposome research. So, for example, the heritability estimates for complex traits are low and variable. So here I just took a, a heritability estimate uh, from, the, from the literature uh, put up by uh, the folks at snippedia.com and just plotted them so you could see, so, see what we're looking at here um, in, in, a, in a visual way. So you have... Things that are uh, with zero heritability up here in the top, like, like stomach cancer or even lung cancer, and I'm sorted by things that we consider to be very heritable. So, so, so for example, eye color, which is considered to be almost 100% heritable. Basically, we could predict one's eye color from, from your parents, for example. But the things that we're very concerned with today, like diabetes, for example, asthma, stroke, a QT interval, uh, coronary artery disease, these burdensome diseases have a low, very, very low heritability. So what this tells us right off the bat, in a very raw way, of course, that, uh, that there's a great opportunity to exploit some of this missing, or, or this, this, uh, this uh, missing uh, um, heritability, if you will. So there's this variability that's not explained by, the, by genetics that, uh, that we could exploit. So that's the, the f first thing, is that most of these things are under 50% that we're concerned with. Another thing that you could uh, that you could really quickly gather is that some of these these diseases have heritabilities that are, have large ranges. So, for example, breast cancer, um, with these studies, are 25 to 50%, and, and bone mineral density, for example, another uh, uh, cl critical clinical trait has heritabilities estimates of 40 to 80%. And autism, one of uh, that is notorious today, has a heritability estimates of 30 to 80 percent. Um, so, of course, this could be due to 
the low sample sizes of families used to calculate these things and so forth, and we've just uh, figured out ways of computing this with, with GWAS data, which I'll talk to you in a second. But at the end of the day, it gives us a great, uh, uh, another great opportunity to sort of clean up the, this, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this idea of variability due to exposome to, to figure out why, in fact, these, are, these, these ranges are so large. So, for example, it took us a large mass of scale data like, the, like genome-wide association studies to converge on this, uh, on this heritability estimate for autism of around 50 percent just recently published in Nature Genetics. And I think this provides also an important opportunity for exposome research to really query this other area of, of, of low heritability. Another thing is that these complex traits and exposures that cause these diseases or, or putative causes of these diseases are very independent. So, for example, uh, uh, diabetologists out there could, would know that uh, body mass index is a, a strong risk factor for type 2 diabetes. And so there's a, a strong connection there. For example, body mass index is, provides one component of, of the etiology of type 2 diabetes, of that of insulin resistance. Of course, you know the other component is beta cell function. And by understanding the uh, environmental contributions of both of BMI and diabetes or beta cell function can help us better understand its etiology. And I'll even argue to say that it will help us understand things that we know of uh, are, are, there are singular environmental risk factors for, for, for diseases. For example, with lung cancer, we know that uh, a good proportion, I'd say 80%, are, is due to, uh, due to smoking, but on the other hand, smoking is, 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 a, is, a, is a matrix of, of, of physical factors that, we, that uh, people are exposed to, uh, for example, um, hydrocarbons and, and other types of uh, chemical factors that expose the, uh, that a broad scale unified way of me measuring um, the environment could enable us to dig deeper into, into that etiology there. So there's room for, for growth here for all these diseases for, for exposome research. Another thing is that in, in current epidemiology studies today is that uh, due to lack of this unifying factor, not probably due to uh, any um, uh, missing methods, is that we're missing the uh, system of exposures that could, uh, that could uh, lead to disease. So, for example, um, under the hood of all of these epidemiology st studies that you might uh, look at or in even uh, genome-wide association studies is you're looking at differences between diseases and non-diseases for, for a handful of exposures denoted here by E plus and E minus. So you're simply looking at the frequency between uh, or in, of enrichment between individuals exposed and have the disease uh, and comparing that for individuals who are not exposed and, and do not have the disease in a very simple way. Um, but, for example, this sort of uh, this, uh, um, this conceptualization kind of misses the system of exposures that we encounter. So not only just a handful of exposures summarized by E plus and E minus, but this matrix of things that we encounter of pollution, diet, and, and, and behaviors and so forth that affect um, a disease risk. So at the end of the day, we're exposed to many different things simultaneously, and we do not assess this multiplicity as such. And it's because of this, one of the main uh, uh, drawbacks of this is that it's difficult to discover novel things connected with disease, for example, searching outside of our, the proverbial lamppost. And the GWAS paradigm ha accomplished this for genetics. So let me describe how, how the uh, uh, geneticists were able to do this, primarily through what is known as the genome-wide association study. And so what this is is basically scaling up the search, a uh, very data-driven search for genetic var variants in, in disease. So remember I told you that we have about 10 million um, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms. Uh, what a GWAS does is proves a, sample, a sampling of this, uh, now on the order of a million of these um, uh, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, and, and tests each of them in turn in an iterative fashion, fashion of differences in that particular um, uh, frequency of that locus, for example, here denoted by uh, uh, homozygous A or heterozygous and, and, uh, and homozygous little a, it, it, frequency differences between cases and controls in a very systematic fashion. The y-axis here is the negative log 10 p-value, and uh, we're organizing all of these SNPs here uh, along the, um, in, in the respective chromosomes that they appear in. And this is known as a, a Manhattan plot representation because when we take the negative log 10 p-value, those that are the strongest associations have lowest p-value and those appear highest on, this, on the plot here and kind of looks like a Manhattan skyline when looking at the uh, entire list of associations. 
So these factors in green here, for example, those in, uh, low on chromosome 2 or on chromosome 6, indicate that there's some association between that locus and disease or control, and controls in this hypothetical cartoon and disease. So what you'd like to do um, is ask a very data-driven question, like what genetic loci are associated with disease with uh, not a candidate uh, approach, or what, what are my favorite genes associated with gene disease, for example, and extend this to look at environmental, um, uh, environmental factors. So what we thought uh, back in 2010 is what if we could do the same, apply the same type of um, uh, concept to looking at or searching for exposures in disease. So instead of looking at different chromosomes, you might have bins of environmental categories, perhaps uh, vitamins, uh, hydrocarbons, metals, or, and pesticides and so forth. And what you'd be doing is looking at uh, differences for each of these factors binned in these, uh, binned in these groups for dis differences between cases and controls. So you have a very high-level view of what's going on for that particular disease of interest, and you can ask this very data-different question about what environmental factors or loci, if you will, are, are connected with your disease of interest. Not is my favorite um, exposure, such as lead or, or beta-carotene, connected to my disease of interest. And this gives a very uh, um, uh, high-level view of and also opens up this realm for discovery. So with that, why would we conduct this thing? It's a comprehensive data-driven and dis discovery-based research. Uh, and so, for example, uh, it's comprehensive and transparent. I'm going to show you everything that I'm going to test in a, in a very transparent way. It's multiplicity controlled. So uh, back before the, uh, back in the days of candidate gene studies, when we were looking at handfuls of, of genetic factors at a time, one of the issues is that, uh, uh, the, or one of the, uh, the things that, that was occurring is that uh, we weren't controlling for multiple hypotheses in, in, in our studies. And here, by uh, setting the threshold at, uh, for this, uh, this very finite domain of genetic factors, we have a, 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 a standardized way of de denoting signal from the noise, and, and which is clear to, to re readers and reviewers when publishing a genome-wide association study. But what is most important is that you open yourself up for novel things that you never had thought about before and that you'd la later like to validate. So, uh, and, and that's one huge advantage of doing a uh, discovery-based data-driven search for factors. But there's no array for exposures as of yet. Um, and one thing that I'll discuss later on is that we are um, uh, slowly uh, uh, coming to such an array, but it's going to take a uh, uh, characterization of, of exposures and technologies to come to this. But for this, uh, for, to, to look at the breadth of exposure information in, in sort of a, a, a test study, we looked at the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which, as you know, is a, is a, a biannual survey that occurs every, 50, every, every two years, sorry, and it's been going on for every 50 years, in, uh, to look at the, the health and nutrition of the, uh, of the United States. And what, what the CDC and NCHS does, the National Center for Health Statistics and Center for Disease Control and Prevention, is they send out these trucks here to different places around the, uh, around the U.S., about 15 different places, and they'll collect about 10,000 per, uh, participants uh, uh, per survey, just like the census might uh, collect for, to assess sociodemographic information every seven years. And so what you have here are over 250 target exposures measured in, in serum and urine. So, of course, they're sampling individuals' um, uh, uh, tissue. And out of this, we can uh, get direct measures of environmental exposure. And also, we, what you have is, are 1,000 uh, genetic uh, loci measured as well. You also have 85 quantitative uh, clinical traits, or those, type, or those phenotypes I was talking about earlier, uh, to assess health and, and, and clinical traits, such as uh, serum glucose, cholesterol, body mass index, height and weight, and so forth. And so you also have extensive data linkages, which are also important to, to, uh, to search for uh, health outcomes. Um, for example, you have the cause of death information linked through the National Death Index of all these of a subset of these individuals, where they live. As you know, geography plays a large role in environmental exposure. That's also very important. You have uh, how they were born through natality information and how they use um, the, the, their medic the, the healthcare system as, as they age. So the examples of these quantitative exposures assessed in serum and urine include uh, markers for nutrients and vitamins, such as vitamin D and carotenoids. You have 
uh, markers for uh, infectious agents and 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 um, infections such as hepatitis, HIV, Staph aureus, and so forth. You have uh, markers for plastics and consumables like phthalates, bisphenol A, pesticides and uh, I'm sorry, pesticides and pollutants such as cadmium and hydrocarbons, and even great quantitative metrics of, of physical activity, such as uh, these um, uh, measures of steps that are given to a subset of, of, these popula of this population. So what you like to do is take this entire body of, 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 of exposures or of, uh, or of behaviors indicative of exposure and assess this to an outcome of interest like diabetes or a quantitative trait like body mass index. Let's show you how this is done in short. So it's a it borrows a lot from the genome-wide association studies, and what we're doing is a comprehensive iterative association between a phenotype of interest and exposure. What we take is a training survey or cohort. We classify those who are diseased and non-diseased, such as, for example, diabetics and non-diabetics. We take all the environmental factors. We do some transformation of them. So as you know, from uh, if you've worked with um, biomarker data, Many of them are right to skewed, and so we've log transformed them and Z-standardized so we can c compare them across uh, different uh, uh, exposures. And we harmonize all the reference groups so they're all pointing at the uh, same, um, uh, same category. Then we simply do a, uh, um, um, a data mining exercise here. We're looking, we use a uh, regression adjusted for uh, known confounders such as age, sex, and SES, and so forth. And we simply look for a correlation between that particular disease and factor, and the tools of interest that we might use include linear regression for quantitative factors, logistics for uh, disease, you can use Cox proportional hazards for time to time to event, and so forth. And we'll look at the significance values and, and, um, for each of these particular factors. So, for example, you get a p-value from your correlation, and we'll build a list of these from all these different sur surveys to see the strengths of association for, for each of the factors. So in a sense, we're done there. We could stop and report some of these things, but we'd like to be uh, we'd like to mitigate the false positive um, uh, rate. So what we do is also another trick from genomics um, and, and mitigate the chance for false positives and to increase the uh, signal to noise ratios. In that we uh, estimate the false discovery rate, and the false discovery rate is actually your expected rate of false positives for a given significance threshold. So it can be written down as the number of false positives at a significance threshold alpha, denoted alpha here, divided by the number of findings you actually produce at that pr uh, alpha. So, for example, suppose I told you that I had 100 findings that have resulted from my EWAS study that had a threshold of less than 0.05. Um, that becomes the denominator. And I told you also that I estimate about 50 uh, false positives at that particular threshold. That means our false discovery rate for the th significant threshold of 0.05 is about 50%. But the problem is that we need to estimate that numerator there, um, uh, the number of false positives for that particular alpha. And so what we do is, to, uh, is we, we do a simulation type of study, and that is we shuffle uh, the disease and non-disease participants and that, in an essence, tries to estimate sort of this null distribution so we can estimate this, uh, this n number of false positives at a particular alpha. So we shuffle the cases and controls, not expecting to find uh, any associations there as it's, as it's null, and rerun this EWAS procedure uh, looking for associations um, by significance. And we repeat this many, many times. And so that, we, that way we have this estimate of, of this numerator here and we have an estimate of the false discovery rate for each of the p-values for each of the factors. Um, and so we choose an FDR threshold. It might be 5 or 10 percent to denote uh, a significant finding. And then what we do is try to validate that finding in, in another survey, an independent survey, um, a validation replication survey. And we deem a replicated or a tentatively validated uh, factor as those that have a low FDR and also have a significant um, p-value in, in the independent test survey. And we also try to estimate the variance due to E. So that we take our, uh, our body of our, our list of exposures connected with that disease of interest and try to estimate the variance of the phenotype due to uh, those uh, multiple exposures that we found to get an estimate of how much more work we need to do for, for, for discovery. And so all of this is modulo. Uh, some of the biases that I'll talk about la uh, later, which are very important to hone down on and also become amplified in, in these sort of data mining exercises. And so our first exercise back four years ago now was to look at exposures connected with diabetes. And so we did this with uh, an Haynes cohort I told you about earlier, um, published in 2010. And so 
Here are the different uh, categories of, of exposure that we arbitrarily created back then. Uh, the different markers denote uh, an association um, uh, um, computed for a, a particular independent cohort denoted here from 1999, 2000, all the way up to 2005, 2006 in the, in the, in the triangles. And so what we looked at is fasting blood glucose greater than 126 milligrams per deciliter, a common way of, uh, or one way of diagnosing type 2 diabetes. We used logistic regression to look for these factors, and we adjusted by a uh, risk factor I told you about earlier for, for, uh, for type 2 diabetes, uh, body mass index. We tried to adjust for uh, socioeconomic uh, status, race, age, sex. And the odds ratios that I'll show you here are for one standard deviation of the log of, of exposure for these uh, quantitative exposure factors. And we were looking at about 500 to 2,000 people per cohort, so in total uh, up to 10,000 individuals. And so the red line here denotes that FDR threshold. Here we used a FDR threshold of about 10%. And the guys that are in the open markers denote the factors that were found at a low FDR in multiple cohorts and were deemed to be validated. So, for example, we found validated factors are found with low FDR and in, uh, in the tra testing set uh, having a significant value. Of these five factors, including cis and trans beta carotene, gamma tocopherol, PCB-170, and heptachloropoxide. So PCB-170 and heptachloropoxide are organic chlorine type of um, uh, compounds. Um, PCB-170 used for man uh, manufacturing of, of, pro of, of, of uh, materials and products, and heptachloropoxide, uh, an organic chlorine type of pesticide. With odds ratio, so basically for a one standard deviation of increase of log exposure, you're looking at up to five, uh, uh, five-fold chance uh, increased chance of being in the cases versus control group for a one cohort of PCB170, PCB170, and greater than almost greater than twofold uh, um, increase chance of being in the cases versus controls for for heptachloropoxide for an increase of, of that uh, standard deviation there. Surprising results for gamma tocopherol, which is a type of vitamin E found um, in, in in oils and so forth. So. For an increase of um, gamma, uh, one standard deviation of gamma tocopherol, we had odds ratios of almost reaching two. And beta carotene factor, uh, um, uh, a carotenoid factor, so for an increase of that particular factor, we had a 40% decrease of uh, likelihood of being in the cases of control, so the odds ratios there are below one. So here we really uh, opened ourselves up to discovery. We, we, um, we ascertained through looking at the, the literature that we, uh, novel findings including heptachloropoxide and gamma tocopherol, which uh, need to be looked at in longitudinal studies that are, and, uh, and, and, and studies that are not cross-sectional such as this. We found things that had been known to be connected with type 2 diabetes in some way like vitamin D, uh, PCBs, beta carotene. I found some interesting patterns through this, such as this mixture of PCBs all creeping up at this significant threshold, and also some um, uh, organochlorine uh, pesticides as well, also seemingly creeping up here, uh, leading to f further hypotheses about this uh, group of, of, of physical factors. So we did the same exercise looking at uh, lipid levels. So lipids, as you know, are, um, are strong factors for uh, risk factors for heart disease, another burdensome um, uh, disease that, uh, uh, in the world. Here, we, we extended the method to look at the quantitative trait of, of uh, log 10 of HDL values, and we adjusted for BMI, SES, race, age, H squared, and sex, and, and did the similar exercise, and we found that organic chlorine pesticides, such as heptachloropoxide, for a one standard deviation change, resulted in a negative 2 milligrams per deciliter um, uh, decrease in HDL cholesterol. So HDL cholesterol, as you know, is the is the good type of marker for uh, uh, mitigation of heart disease risk. It's, it's uh, arguable if it's on the, on the disease pathway towards myocardial infarction or heart disease, but it's a great marker for, for heart disease risk. So heptachloropoxide was associated with uh, negative values of that. Also mercury, which we may think could be uh, a biased factor, confounded, was associated with higher levels of, of, uh, of HDL cholesterol. That could be due to um, uh, cardioprotective factors such as fish consumption. Mercury is known to bioaccumulate in fish, and that could be one reason of, uh, why we're picking that up. Uh, other things uh, included things that were found in the matrix of cigarette exposure and pollution and air pollution, like hydrocarbons such as hydroxyfluorine, which is connected with the negative um, HDL levels. 
uh, codeine, a, a marker or metabolite of nicotine, um, found in the matrix, or also um, indicative of cigarette smoking behavior. And a vast uh, array of vitamins, nutrients, minerals, and, and carotenoids all connected with HDL cholesterol in some way. So in one way, you have a way of discovering factors connected with disease, but also this is also indicative of things that could be um, uh, confounding or, or, or indicative of other behaviors that could be connected with, with HDL cholesterol, which I'll get to in a second, like, like mercury. But all in all, a generalizable way of looking at uh, uh, or, or looking for uh, or new factors connected with the outcome of interest. But as you know, just like we have many genetic factors and environmental factors exposed to many environmental factors, humans are a manifestation of many phenotypes. And so for some clinical phenotypes that a doctor might look at, uh, for example, are, include those of the metabolic traits, so those that we just discussed, like glucose, HDL cholesterol, also ALDL cholesterol, and triglycerides. And so these are sort of these uh, EWASs that we'd already produced at, on these outcomes um, that we discussed a little earlier. But you could also imagine that you could do these types of studies of looking at uh, uh, different indicators of body measures, like body mass index or height, blood pressure, such as uh, systolic and diastolic blood pressure, uh, markers of inflammation, like C-reactive protein and white blood cell count, and important uh, indicators of, of complex disease, including cre kidney function and liver function, um, uh, the, uh, uh, clinical phenotypes related to that, such as serum creatinine, and, and, and aspartate aminotransferase for, for liver function. So you could really scale up the search for environmental factors, like we have with genetic factors to look at each of these uh, traits in, um, individually or as a group. And that's exactly what we're, uh, what we're uh, positing uh, to you today, another way of looking at it. So imagine you had a giant spreadsheet in which you could a were able to collate all these environment-wide association results. So in one row, you have uh, uh, fasting glucose, and you have indicate a, an association by uh, color, such as, for example, PCB170, positively correlated with uh, serum glucose, we'll color it yellow here. Maybe serum folate is negatively connected with uh, uh, increased levels of glucose, and we'll color it blue, as is beta carotene, as I showed you earlier. So we'll color it also blue because it's connected with a, a lower level of glucose. So you could build this matrix up and look at, um, and, and look at other traits, such as BMI, height, and cholesterol, and start filling in the dots here about different exposures connected with all these all these traits at once. So you have now a 2D view of phenotype exposure associations that you can look at um, uh, across, across the, the phenome and, and the exposome. And so that's exactly what we're in process of doing. So we're, we're creating a phenotype exposure association map, a 2D view of 83 clinical phenotypes and 252 exposure associations. So here, imagine that each of your entries uh, determines an, or, or denotes an association size. Maybe yellow is greater than zero, blue is less than zero for a particular association between an exposure and a phenotype. Um, and you, and you, this way you can ask whether groups of exposures are associated with, with groups of phenotypes. So of course, um, uh, these clinical phenotypes are correlated as well as exposures, and we, we cannot um, uh, ascertain basically we cannot assume that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence in association between exposures and phenotypes. And looking at these as groups may enable us to dig down into etiologies or of, of different diseases connected with phenotypes. So here what we did was we looked at 252 biomarkers of exposure, 83 clinical phenotypes in, in, in the Anne Haynes, uh, 99-2005-2006. And in all, when you compute the, these uh, pairwise associations between exposure and phenotypes, you're, you have about 21,000 individual regressions that you're computing between phenotype and exposure. And we replicated these significant ones in 2003 and 2004 uh, independent survey. And again, we tried to adjust out for age, age squared, sex, race, income, and indicators of, of chronic disease. And so here's a high-level overview of this exposome phenome map. If you'd like, you could go ahead and browse over to this link on this ro lower right corner and check it out yourself. It's a lot of information to show in just a, a few slides here, but again, this uh, color indicates the uh, association between a particular exposure, shown here on the x-axis, and a phenotype, shown here on the y-axis. So, for example, here I'm pointing to a cluster of, of associations uh, that are negatively connected with uh, body mass index. So, uh, 
Um, higher levels of these particular fact or factors indicate lower levels of body mass index, and the reverse for uh, factors that are colored in, in yellow here. So higher levels of, of these factors indicate higher levels of these uh, clinical factors as well. So you could zoom in on certain uh, certain parts of the map to get a better idea of, uh, of these associations. So for example, out here I've zoomed into the uh, factors that are connected closely with bl white blood cell count or, or uh, indication, indicators of, of inflammation. So all these factors are correlated with, with white blood cell count. And I've also zoomed into those that have, are cor correlated with uh, serum coatinate. And you can see that there's strong correlations between these inflammatory markers and one um, a marker of physical fitness like pulse rate connected with higher levels of, of, of these markers for, for smoking, such as cotinine, indicators of behavior for smoking, such as uh, if individuals had smoked 100 cigarettes in their life or had cigarettes in the last 30 days, and perhaps other ma indicators of the cigarette smoking matrix like cadmium, benzene, and toluene, and so forth down the line there. This, you could still show a similar story for body mass index. So here are all the clinical traits connected with body mass index or strongly correlated with body mass index. And here are the traits that are, or the exposure factors that are strongly correlated with beta carotene. And so you could see that the associations for between beta carotene, so higher levels of beta carotene, um, and, and, and correlated factors like alpha carotene, cis beta carotene, are all uh, similarly um, associated with lower levels of body mass index, waist circumference, trunk fat, and even things that you wouldn't um, expect at, at, its fa at its face to be connected with, uh, with lower levels of car carotene like um, CRP, another measure of inflammation. And so we found a total of uh, up to one to 66 exposures found for these, uh, for, 80, um, for 81 clinical factors. So I, I remember I told you we began with 83. Uh, of these 252 exposures that we're looking at in those 83 clinical factors or clinical phenotypes, we found 81 had evidence that uh, at least one exposure validated or uh, replicated in, in for that particular factor. And we found a range for between 1 and 66 for each of these 81 factors. But on the other hand, so the additive effect, when you look at the additive effect of these environmental factors, they describe on average less than 20% of variability in, in each of those phenotypes here. And so, for example, basophils here, um, uh, 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 might characterize uh, uh, blood, has, uh, has an R-squared value for those exposures that were found in it of, of less, or less than uh, 5%. Um, same with uh, uh, prostate-specific antigen in, in total and free form. Um, and, and so forth. And so if you look at the average, you're looking at about 8% of those uh, 1 to 66 exposures describing um, that variance in that, in that phenotype there. So we have a lot, a lot uh, left in, in describing sort of the environmental components, if any, for the variation in, in these phenotypes here. And we'll need to extend uh, look, uh, looking at the exposome in a more comprehensive scale than 250 exposures to really dig deeper into the variance due to exposures for these particular phenotypes. I welcome you to check out our association map. Um, we just recently built it and, and put it up for perusal and for comments. You could uh, uh, cruise on over to our resources or page or this bit.ly link, bit.ly.com slash PE map to check it out yourself and download the, download the map and play around with it yourself as well. Uh, we encourage that, uh, uh, your opinions and so forth, so please uh, hit us up uh, with that. And so I, what, I'd like to, uh, what I'd like to also say is that it's possible to execute these types of studies in other cohorts and study design. So we've done this with cholesterol, blood pressure, where we found um, uh, persistent organic pollutants um, and certain nutrients, blood pressure, where the high heart rate had been uh, not so much information about folate in connection with uh, blood pressure. Um, uh, we looked at all-cause mortality. We didn't find anything new per se, but we were able to replicate things such as cadmium and physical activity connected with all-cause mortality. Um, we looked at mothers with preterm birth uh, and, and, and found a, um, uh, an association, albeit weak, with bisphenol A and moms who later give preterm birth. Um, another one that we have in press is looking at um, these exposure factors in connection with income. And so here the takeaway is that we must uh, pay attention to things that may mediate some of these associations, as 20% of the exposure factors that uh, told you about earlier were all connected with income in some way. 
And others have utilized it in their own studies in the context of the clinical record um, and, and other epidemiological studies, such as uh, looking at the metabolic syndrome, um, uh, Monica Lund and colleagues in Sweden, and also in the electronic health record uh, with Molly Hall looking at it, type 2 diabetes in, at, at the, um, in their electronic health record cohort in, in Cleveland. And so uh, here's an example of is the nutrient-wide association study that we we're able to execute in blood pressure. And what I emphasize here is that uh, it's a very generalizable way of looking at, um, at factors connected with your outcome. Here we looked at the InterMAP study, which is the, an international study of, uh, of uh, blood pressure. We took a training set and a testing set to look to find and to search for and, and, and uh, internally replicate um, factors connected with blood pressure. So here are some connected with systolic blood pressure, such as alcohol, uh, vegetable protein, all the way down to um, folate that had um, few, few uh, published uh, evidence in, in the literature. And then we did an external um, validation looking, looking at NHANES to see if we could replicate some of those associations uh, in, our, in our InterMAP study in, in, a, in a larger, um, uh, albeit cross-sectional one in NHANES. And some of these did, in fact, replicate like folate um, with smaller, smaller effect sizes. So I think this type of tool can be used going forward to look at any risk factor uh, of interest um, in, in your cohorts today. I know there are large ones that, are, uh, that have um, a lot of environmental factors, uh, mostly dietary, in, in these cohorts that we can start pinning down these individual factors connected with the multitude of phenotypes that exist in these large databases. And for this, we do have a software library coming soon. Again, check out our GitHub page and, and our web page um, for updates on this front. So possibilities of discovery with the exposome, how do we proceed? So recently, John Ioannidis and, and, uh, and I wrote a paper uh, on, on how we can start looking at uh, ways of uh, 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 branching out our informatics techniques to, to really look at this elusive environment in large scale. So the first thing we need to do is start evaluating new omics technologies, which seem to have the promise of assessing a large amount of uh, both uh, endogenous and exogenous fact, uh, environmental factors in, in large scale, so things such as metabolomics. Here the central challenges will be identifying uh, which factors are, are, are emerged from these um, uh, large scale metabolomic wide uh, studies. There have already been evidence uh, of, of, of these in process, but to scale it up to look at many factors in a targeted way remains, remains a challenge in, in identification. Another one is actually how to develop new ways, or we need to develop new, uh, new ways of, uh, and studies to tackle the complexity. So we recently showed that uh, there is a, um, an issue of what causes what. The exposures tend to be densely correlated with one another, and there's also a correlated issue of a corral, uh, corollary to that of reverse causation. Also, confounding and mediation become uh, um, uh, issues that epidemiologists have, have been dealing with since the start that now become um, uh, amplified in, in this large scale in these larger studies. And we'll also need some uh, longitudinal and linkable publicly available data to enable methods development and reproducibility of, of, of findings um, and, and to increase our yield in, in findings. So I'll talk about that just briefly uh, as a matter of, of opinion. So in, in genetics, we have this large uh, uh, repository for to store environmental exposure and phenotype information known as the database of genotypes and phenotypes, where any investigator uh, or principal investigator can apply for and download the studies that have existed, like GWAS, um, that examine genetics and phenotypes in, 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 in human populations. And so what you have in these databases are over or on the order of 800,000 individuals, over 400 studies, and which equate to a 1 billion data points, uh, including genotypes and phenotypes, and it's yielded a massive amount of manuscripts, so over 950 manuscripts, as uh, Paul to et al. Uh, uh, documented nature genetics. And there's a genomics share data sharing policy that is in place now in, uh, as of August of this year, that all data, uh, there must be a data sharing plan uh, for all data, genomic related data, uh, when applying for new grants uh, come, come this, January, this January of the new year. And so I'd just like, simply like to ask, why does this uh, policy not extend to environmental exposures? We need a DB gap for environmental exposures to develop methods like we have uh, in NHANES to quickly accelerate the, or to accelerate discoveries with exposures and phenotype information. And so uh, the last part is to, uh, how to uh, 
to uh, to develop methods for data mining and, 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 and study designs to tackle some of this complexity here. So to, to get a, a, a glimpse of uh, this complexity of the exposome, we simply uh, looked at the exposome like we do in, in genetics today, and that's uh, through a correlation globe. And so what we did was simply compute the interdependency or a spearmint correlation between each pair of, cor of exposures and enhanced through a spearmint correlation, or just for, for, for BMI and, and, and creatinine. And we permitted the data to get some idea of signal to noise, and we sought replication in an independently left, uh, left out cohort. And we plotted it as a globe. So, for example, here are the correlations between factors of smoking and other factors around of the exposome, like volatile organic compounds and uh, correlations between smoking and hydrocarbons, for example, denoted in red. And in blue, you have negative correlations, so you'll have factors of, like, of, that, of smoking uh, negatively correlated with uh, certain nutrient factors like, like beta-carotene. And you know the next step is to do this uh, at a large scale across the uh, large swath of exposure measurements you have in, in, in HANES, and we did that. And so, for example, you'd see correlations between PCBs and dioxins here, strong correlations between those furans and dioxins, strong correlations between smoking behaviors and, and, and factors like cotinine and volatile organic compounds and hydrocarbons, uh, strong correlations between hydrocarbons and phthalates, and so forth down the line here. So it becomes a new challenge to dissect which factors you're actually detecting in your environment-wide association studies. Is it a factor of interest, or are you detecting um, a factor that's strongly correlated with others and, uh, and that you need to hone down on? And so, for example, uh, if you just map out those that were connected with disease, so here's an exposome globe that just looks at the factors that were connected with those that were found in type 2 diabetes. So here in the, in the, in the um, different colors here, I show factors that were connected with uh, diabetes, like vitamin D, gamma tocopherol, trans beta carotene, hepatochloropoxide, and PCB 170s. 170 and simply ask which ones are those correlated with across the exposome. And you see this map of that look like uh, persistent organic uh, uh, compounds connected with those, which may indicate um, those factors may also be playing a role in, 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 in diabetes outcome, or that these factors that are found were also have a similar uh, metabolic fate, that they're all uh, persistent and, and hang around the body in the same way. And these make... Uh, uh, these make a, 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 a display uh, possible when looking at different um, um, phenotypes at once. So here's, on the left-hand side, I again show the diabetes example. And on the right-hand side, you have the example for all-cause mortality or death. So these are factors that we found in an EWAS looking at uh, time to death, such as physical activity, translycopene, and smoking, and, and cadmium. And so you see here that the, the things that pop up for all-cause mortality or those or factors that are correlated with those that pop up for all-cause mortality are much different than those that are coming up for diabetes. So for diabetes, you have this matrix connected with uh, diet, uh, like vitamin D and, and perhaps gamma tocopherol and, um, and persistent pollutants, whereas with mortality or death, you have things that come up with behaviors such as physical activity and, and, and smoking. So by displaying these uh, correlation globes in such a way, you can uh, start to hone down on the behaviors or the groups of exposures that might be uh, um, uh, connected with your disease of interest in, in a systems fashion. So I, what I'd like to leave you with is that it, I believe that with EWAS, it's possible to accelerate the pace of discovery ex exposures. I, I posit to you that it's a generalizable and transparent way of looking at the environment, and we've created hypotheses for type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease and other traits. Uh, so we found effect sizes that were comparable with genetic studies of 1 to 10 milligrams per deciliter for cholesterol, uh, odds ratios of 2 to 3 for diabetes, and what I didn't show you for mortality, about uh, 1.5 to 2 hazard ratios. And our squared values that are about eight, uh, two to 0 to 2 percent, or uh, on average 8 percent for some of these quantitative factors. A modulo some of these things, biases like confounding and, and related, um, related factors such as mediation and reverse causality. Another thing that we need to be um, wary of is this dense correlation web of, of exposure. Uh, how do we pin down what causes what? But what I'd like to emphasize is that it's possible to do, use this method to quickly sort through a list of exposures to, to know what to test next in um, a longitudinal study, or if it's a protective factor, uh, a clinical trial. So as you know, complex disease is a function of genes and environments, but we rarely test how together 
uh, they might increase or decrease risk for disease in this, under this framework of gene environment interaction. And so what we also posited, so I, I will also hypothesize to you, is that using these tools will enable us to, to discover new interactions or new ways of hypothesizing about etiology between genes and environment in, in disease. So here we simply looked at um, factors that were found in an EWAS study for diabetes, and we took at, we took at, we took at the, uh, extracted the variants that were uh, found in a, in a type 2 diabetes GWAS, so on here on the bottom here. So these are all the variants also shown in the Manhattan plot view um, connected with type 2 diabetes as published by Ben Voigt and colleagues, colleagues in 2010. And we simply asked, are those variants that were found in type 2 diabetes interact with those that we found in our environment-wide association studies back in 2010? And long story short, yes, indeed, they do. And so by conducting these studies, we can narrow down the space of the complexity and look and, and find factors that might have some role in, uh, for, predict, for better prediction of type 2 diabetes risk. So to, for an example, I show here a, the marginal odds ratio for a genetic factor, this YRS132634 in the SLC30A8 gene, which is um, a protein that uh, transports zinc in and out of the beta cell. Um, and we have, for this particular variant in this particular gene found in GWAS, an odds ratio of about uh, 1.1. So individuals who have that particular variant have on the order of 10% increased risk for diabetes than individuals who don't have that uh, particular variant. But then when we start considering these environmental factors that we found in our EWAS studies, so um, again, it's not comprehensively looking at all of the environmental factors that we could have found, but just these uh, found in, um, in EWAS seem to have some uh, uh, interaction with this particular SNP here. So individuals that have low levels of this particular uh, nutrient factor, all of a sudden their genetic risk goes up to twofold. Um, and individuals who have higher levels of this particular factor seem, seem to mitigate that um, genetic risk. Also, the story is switched around for a correlated exposure like gamma tocopherol. Individuals who have a higher genetic risk for those individuals, for uh, uh, on average, if they have higher levels of, of this particular um, nutrient factor. So by looking at these factors jointly with genetic factors, we could uh, uh, create new hypotheses not only about uh, uh, um, uh, about uh, genetic factors connected with disease, but how environmental factors may also pull, play a role in, in, in disease risk. <clears throat> so here I will uh, hypothesize, I posit again to you that it, it's possible to detect gene environment interactions by combining these um, genomic uh, and environment-wide tools. Of course, we need to replicate these results. I didn't show you replicated results, and, and we're in the process of doing that. Um, and the name of the game with gene environment interactions is that we need large N to do this. And so by paring down the search space by using uh, EWAS or GWAS tools will allow us to uh, gather more uh, signal to noise um, when looking for these factors. And so the, uh, another fact, another thing that we may need to be uh, take heed of is that uh, the biological mechanism of interaction is, is elusive. So these factors may be tagging behaviors and, of course, are, are, not, are not causal, just as I described to you earlier with the environment-wide association studies and just as we've had uh, or we're dealing with, with genome-wide association studies. So here they may be tagging behaviors and we need to uh, figure out what those behaviors or even what exposures are connected with those, uh, with those, uh, with those tagging um, exposures just as uh, we've tried to do with the exposed on globes. And I think that we can re recapture major GWAS investment by considering some prevalent environment, fact environment factors. And this uh, assumes that we're, we have the substrate, like biological tissues, measured alongside with, uh, with our GWAS chips to do these types of studies. And I think uh, this is an area that we should head into the future. So in conclusion, on EWAS on the exposome, I, I believe that informatics cap capability will enable this high throughput discovery of exposures in health and disease just like it has with, with genetics today. Um, and it's, this is provided uh, that we can characterize and measure the exposome. And I, and I think we are getting there, but uh, we have a lot of work to do to get to that elusive uh, uh, exposome chip that we can all as, as use and measure the exposome in, in large populations. 
Uh, and a central challenge will be integrating the exposome and genome together for a complete view of our health. And so once we have that exposome measurement, how can we combine it with the genome? So here is a, uh, one uh, sort of uh, uh, exposition of how we're trying to do it with clinical results so that you could check out in genome medicine. So here we had the opportunity to look at 10 individuals with, um, or eight individuals with full genome sequencing information who came into a wellness and health maintenance clinic and got some markers of, uh, of, of bio clinical biomarkers measured. And the challenge there was how to combine information from the genome, so uh, the genetic risk, in domains uh, such as um, immunolo immunological diseases, respiratory diseases, cardiovascular diseases, uh, musculoskeletal diseases, metabolic diseases, and combine them with their current clinical traits um, assessed in each of these domains. And what we found was that it's very hard to provide a presentation of uh, genetic risk in combination with these clinical risks. So here is the genetic risk for some of these for in an individual for um, some chronic diseases, just based on GWAS hits. So, for example, this individual, based on their uh, genetic variants, has a increased risk for a coronary artery disease. And then when you start considering their clinical factors, all of a sudden uh, uh, their, um, their, their disease risk for coronary artery disease goes up from that, uh, from that setting of uh, 50%, or it goes down to, uh, or the genetic risk goes down based on their clinic, uh, clinical outcomes. And so as you can fathom, in my difficulty in explaining this to you, it's, it's going to be very hard to combine this for an individual basis uh, to integrate this information for a complete view of our health. And I believe that uh, an opinion of mine is that conducting these sort of large-scale environment uh, research will require fluency in biostatistics, genomics, bioinformatics, computational biology, and also, of course, environmental health, space of geomedicine, and also epidemiology. And in, in that vein, we're hiring, and I'll take advantage of this platform to say that we're hiring um, computationally inclined scientists and informaticians um, both at the postdoc graduate level and, and also technical staff, and there's a data scientist engineer position open now. You can just browse over and check it out if you'd like. With that, I'd like to thank um, David, uh, Yusha, and also Kim, who's provided some feedback on, on, these, uh, on this talk at the NIEHS for giving me this opportunity and platform to talk about our, um, our, our studies and results. And, of course, uh, my new group here at Harvard, Dr. Zach Kohani and uh, old friends at Stanford, John Ioannidis and Atul Butte, and also David Rakoff. And, of course, uh, the work of uh, our, uh, my close collaborators and students here, including Denise McGinnis, Raj Monroy, and Eric Corona, whose work I didn't get to show you today, but I'm, well, I'm very excited about tying together new ways of uh, exposome and genomes. I hope to describe to you in the future. Again, if you have any questions, please email me or check out our website, and I'd love to take your questions now. We're right on at 12. Thank you very much.